Good morning. Happy second Sunday in Advent. I'm Marin Tirabasi, and I'm the guest pastor for uh, the month of December before Terry Kruger arrives in January. I am delighted to be here. I am so grateful to the tech team and the worship preparation team and the people who volunteered um, to do parts of worship and also the people who volunteered to fill in for people who volunteered to do parts of worship when they didn't have power this morning. And I celebrate the fact that one of the gifts that we get out of this difficult virtual church time is that we now learn how to have worship when we have snow days after we're open again. And this is the first Sunday that we truly have that. So we not only have the Zoom, which keeps those who are connected right here um, in a very personal and intimate contact. And we have the Facebook Live, which allows anyone who has no power today to watch this service at any time during the week. So we have done, um, you know, Jesus said, go to the ends of the earth and tell the good news. We have done our best to do that. And it's a wonderful thing. Maybe all the tech won't be perfect today, but we're going to try. And um, a couple of tech notes. Um, if you do speaker view, um, you're likely to get the person who's speaking um, with uh, face front, and also you're minimized in terms of the Facebook Live feed. Um, and um, if you mute, your background noise won't impact 
the video, but also you can sing the carols. If you're mute, you can open up your mouths and sing your hearts out um, without anyone hearing your flat notes, which is why I should <laughs> remember to mute as soon as I'm done speaking. But a joyous day to all of you. And we turn now to fortunately pre-recorded the lighting of the Advent candle for the second Sunday in Advent. In our church and homes, we gather around wreaths to pray our lost hopes, broken peace, limited joys in the season of coronavirus. We affirm that our candles mean we claim the power to call this season Advent, when God's light comes into the world and nothing can overcome it. We relight the candle of hope. We now light the candle of peace. Who shines in spite of everything that works against peace in our world, our communities, our homes, and even in our own spirits. God's peace illuminates the possibility of reconciliation and healing and brightens the path to joy. Emmanuel, God will God be with us in the week to come, lighting hope and peace on the wick of our lives so that we may shine on our world, on our world, amen. Our opening hymn is O Little Town of Bethlehem. Oh. 
please join me today in today's opening prayer. Emmanuel, we thank you for the moments of peace we have in this season. Your peace is not just a Christmas card or email. Looking up at the bright stars and the sweet illumination of our neighbor's decorations, dropping in an ominous bill in the Salvation Army kettle or calling a lonely friend, but those things renew us as peacemakers. Teach us to pass peace to others and as, as, as has passed, been passed to us, especially remembering those whose lives are in pieces. Amen. I'm sorry to say that um, Margie is not able to deliver the children's message today. And so I am going to fill in with the natural uh, suggestion that it is indeed December 6th, St. Nicholas Day. And if you don't really know much about St. Nicholas, you could have a visual of the modern day interpretation of St. Nicholas. So St. Nicholas is the true person behind the myth that is different in every country of Santa Claus. So let me tell you, he was, he was born in the third century in southern Turkey. He was born to wealth, but a, um, an epidemic, certainly for them a pandemic, um, since it was the whole world that they knew about was the Mediterranean basin, came through and uh, killed his parents. And one of the things that he did as a teenager was listen to the Christian message that he should give all his money away. So he spent a lot of time giving away that which he had. The story that led to our use of Christmas stockings is this, and is probably the one that is not mythical. Um, I'm going to say putting together the pieces of people who've been kept in pickle jars is probably a myth. But that his next door neighbor had three daughters and that young women had a very hard time getting married if they didn't have a dowry at this time is true. And what he did was in the night, he went and he put gold pieces in all of their stockings hanging out to dry so that each young woman had a dowry so that when she came to the time of being married, she had money to take with her and to join into the family. That's another culture and another time and we don't even think about, goodness, dowries now. But the generosity that is hidden is part of the myth of the chimney. And the generosity that is wholehearted is part of the myth of giving to everyone. Okay, some countries develop coal stories. I have a friend um, who was raised as a young boy, as a Latvian in the concentration camps. And um, there were Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians, and they all had a very different Santa. So at Christmas time, they would all go, and the bad children would get spankings. Not original to St. Nicholas, who gave to those who deserved it and gave to those whom other people didn't think deserved it because his sense was that God loved everybody and that the gifts we have are to be passed along. Now, Margie was gonna read Christmas Moccasins uh, by Ray Buckley. It's a wonderful story, hunt it down. Um, but it also shares the same thing, giving away 
is the greatest gift one can give to oneself. Let's pray. Holy God, teach us to be givers. Help us to be open enough to receive the gifts that are given to us. Amen. I'll get respectable. Please join me in today's prayer of confession. Oh God, sometimes we pray one way prayers which allow no time for listening. Sometimes we give gifts as an obligation without being aware that the model for our tradition is your gift to us of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we pray for Christmas holiness in our homes and church rather than opening a year long and heart shaped room for an inn at the inn for friends, strangers, children we meet, the lonely and the blessed child. Forgive and restore us so we find our rest in your love. Amen. Assurance of grace. With these words, God reassures us of our gracefulness. Like a manager in a barn, forgiveness is something we could see every day and never realize its true purpose. We are forgiven so we can change God's world. Our hymn of praise is O Holy Night. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear. Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill
Now we would like to come together and share with one another the joys and concerns that are with us right now. If you would like to share something personal, please only use the first name of other people. We'll call on people to share if I see a ray of some sort of sign that they want to speak. There are only a few here on Zoom, but for those of you on Facebook, maybe we can follow with a silent prayer for those who are we concerned with or want to celebrate with. Is there anybody here on Zoom that would like to speak? Okay, then maybe we can say a silent prayer for those who are on Facebook watching this and uh, go from there. Or if, or if um, someone else would like to say a prayer, that's fine. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, Emmanuel, you are the light that shines into our lives. The carols that sing our stories and the candles lit in our sanctuary and the story from so long ago. All of these keep us well and whole and a community. We pray for those who are suffering because of this weekend's snow. Those who are at risk clearing the roads, those who are isolated without electricity and no generator to back up, those who feel like it's just a deeper isolation from all that has passed in the last nine months. We lift them up before you. We pray as well for the people of Middle Collegiate Church in New York, which burned down yesterday. We pray for that congregation as they gather online and worship and care for one another. We pray for those who have celebrations and want to burst with joy, but know that it's such a sober time that they wonder if they have permission. Bless them to open their hearts and let their celebration shed light and hope on all the rest of us. For those in the midst of joy, for those in the midst of sorrow, for those in the midst of struggle, for those who are longing for the memorial services long delayed, for those who are working in healthcare long hours and deep risks, for those who are essential working workers providing us with food and transportation, we pray. And we pray, O oh Holy One, using the words that Jesus, when he grew up, taught his disciples as the prayer that we should know. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And all who feel life's crushing loads, whose lives are bending low, and toilers on the climbing way, these painful months and slow, look now 
for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. Rest here. Rest in First Congregational Church of Wakefield beside your weary road and hear the angels sing. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading starts with was Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, and continuing on to verses 9 through 11. It's titled, God's People Are Comforted. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn. And her penalty is paid that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Get you up to a high mountain. O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. And to end today's scripture reading, we have Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, titled, The Visit of the Wise Men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd at my people, Israel. And that ends today's scripture reading. Please join me in responding to the word as indicated by Paul on your screen momentarily. <laughs> God's word is a lamp for our paths and a light for straight and wandering paths. Wherever we go, God's word goes with us. Wherever we rest, it fills us up, fills us with peace. Advent is here. Christmas is coming and we all need a little comfort. A twinkle in the corner of the eyes, a tilt to the lips, a chuckle. We want to tuck a bit of the joy into our hearts. Christmas is coming and we all need a little comfort, what they call peace of mind and we know as peace of heart. We don't need to be made comfortable, and our Christian faith is not likely to let that happen because for every blessed are you, there's also, when you do this for the least of these, you do it for me. But we need a little comfort, a little tenderness, a little love. We live in a world of fears and pains and lonely hearts. 
We see it in the headlines of the global pandemic. We see it in op-ed pages when we're reminded that this season is always a time when folks are depressed, when the bright lights and the calls of good tidings often make the not acceptable feelings worse, when people blame themselves or those nearest to them. The losses of last year are deep, but also are the losses of older years that brush their memories off and just hang there on the tree. The tastes and smells and sights and sounds are just not the same as with a spouse who has died, a child who's far away, or maybe the child is here, but there isn't enough money, or there's a divorce lurking, or good cheer looks like it might be best served out of a bottle. Christmas is coming anyway. So happy, so sad, so bright with stars and tears. And we need a little comfort with our carols, a little kindness with our creches, a little tenderness with the tinsel, a little laughter with the lists. We need a good dose of Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet of Christmas. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light, he wrote. He told the story of the peaceable kingdom. He said, a virgin shall bear a child and name him Emmanuel. And this passage, this passage, comfort my people, says God, speak tenderly to them. The valleys will be lifted up and the mountains will be made low, the uneven ground and the rough places will become a plain. So whatever path you or I take, whether we need the valley of depression lifted up, the potholes of really bad circumstances filled in, or the hills of coronavirus fear, which I didn't feel that I was having too much of until I checked in at my annual physical last week and suddenly was so afraid of the waiting room that I said, if I go to my car, will you call me when it's time to go in? Maybe that gives you an idea of how late my doctor usually is. And it was okay. There's job loss. There's being overwhelmed by homeschooling, having children around without ever a moment alone except taking a shower. And on the other hand, for people, desperate loneliness, anxiety about somebody who's near, or the inability to say goodbye to someone dear who has a memorial service delayed. All those things that seem like huge mountains in our lives can become just slightly bigger than mole hills. Isaiah writes, this is what God's like. God's like a shepherd with a sheepdog I hear barking. God's like a shepherd that gathers the lamb and carries the weak ones and leads the ewes. Whatever particular comfort that we need, God gently leads us to it. Because of course, people have a bad habit of walking directly away from the things that would bring them the most ease of mind. Now this Advent season, I'm using backgrounds of the carols that we sing, not all of them, but some of them, um, as a way to look at the season. O Little Town of Bethlehem was written by Philip Brooks in response to his severe depression. This brilliant young pastor of Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia grew the congregation to more than a thousand, which Sounds like a mega church now, but in those days of horse and buggy transport um, to church was an enormous group. And then the Civil War began, and he looked out, and all he could see 
what is widows in black clothing. Everybody knew someone who died and the tearing apart of the nation destroyed both sides and yet he was okay. He preached, he visited people, he did all of the pastoral care, managing to keep that depression at bay until he was asked and he did officiate at the funeral of Abraham Lincoln. The war was passed, and yet there was one more terribly sad thing, and he couldn't handle life. He took a sabbatical, a sabbatical and he went to the Middle East. And on Christmas Eve, overwhelmed by the crowd of people in Jerusalem, he rented a horse, which they said was really dangerous because there were bandits, but he rented this horse and he rode the five miles out to Bethlehem and sat over the hill and just looked at that town. As night fell and the stars got brighter, he felt he had a singing in his soul. Later he said he thought that it would keep singing all of his life. He didn't know that when he wrote, the hopes and fears of all the years will meet in thee tonight, it was going to be the hopes of fears of 2020 are met in you tonight. Now with comfort comes peace and generosity. I read an article this week in the paper about a woman in Boulder, Colorado. Last year, she was unemployed and living in what they call a welfare motel. She got a job as a dental assistant and she got an apartment. She was comforted and grateful. And so she decided to make a drive up, uh, pick up Thanksgiving meal for people who didn't know um, where their next meal was coming, didn't have the cash, but didn't want to be on a needy list where their names would be kept, and didn't want, above all things, to go to a not physically distant Thanksgiving meal. So she put her invitation on Craigslist, and 40 people came to her curbside to receive kindness from a woman who had needed that very charity the year before. And here's data from the Journal of Science. I'm very proud. This is not my usual reading fair, but it got mediated through NPR. There's a study, was a study using college students. Each one was given either a warm heating pad to hold on to, or an ice pack to hold in their hands. They were told that there would be this participation uh, reward that they could choose between something that would be for them to enjoy or something that they could give as a gift for somebody else. What the study found was the volunteers who were holding the warm pad almost often, often uh, chose a gift for a friend. Those who were holding the ice pack always chose the gift for themselves. So people who are comforted and become able to reach out to others. Comfort my people, says God. And then isn't it amazing what they can do? What a beautiful message for December 6th, for St. Nicholas Day, when we have just that sliver of a beginning of the story of the Magi who were directed to a town called House of Bread to find the child for whom they had been searching in order to give gifts. But peace, it's the Sunday of peace. What about that? In the United States, the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery, is also remembered today, December 6th, when Georgia's vote 
made it a reality. And so the appropriate song for this was the second one we heard. It was O Holy Night. That was specifically imported to the United States from France, where it had been banned and could not be sung because the words were by Placide Capot, who was an amateur poet, but also a socialist. And the composer, Adolf Adams, was Jewish. And people who had written music in either of those categories, either socialist or Jewish, their music was not allowed to be sung in churches. So it was imported by John Sullivan Dwight to the United States, who was an abolitionist before the Civil War because of that third verse. Truly Christ taught us to love one another. Broken are chains and the gospel of peace. The one enslaved is my sister and brother, and in love's name, all oppression shall cease. Does that mean that the beautiful song caused division rather than peace? No. It was the carol that sparked the very first Christmas truce in the Franco-Prussian War, but it also has another bit and you're going to just give me this ability to tell you one more bit of history. So Richard Fessenden was, um, he's from Pittsburgh, and he was Thomas Edison's chief chemist. He used a new kind of generator um, the very first time to send words rather than tapped code over radio waves. So before this, it had all been Morse code, and he had this generator that would carry the human voice. 1906, Christmas Eve, startling office workers and ships out at sea, which kept their radios on all the time, when his voice came over the air saying the famous words, and it came to pass that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. And when he finished the passage, he picked up his violin and he played O Holy Night. That's the very first music to travel over airwaves, music of peace. Advent's here, Christmas is coming, and we need a little comfort. We need a twinkle in the corner of the eyes, a tilt to the lip, a chuckle. I'm pretty glad that Max and Cindy found an upbeat version of White Christmas for us to begin our prelude. Um, and I admit, I picked that secular song, even though it is not religious, because I think that like Silent Night, it's a signature song for this year. Now it was written first for the movie Holiday Inn. Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire courting one girl, one by singing and one by dancing, and it was written, the music was written by Irving Berlin. Born Israel Balin in Moelev, Russia, immigrated into poverty on the Lower East Side of New York. He insisted, he became such a well-known musician, composer and writer of lyrics, and he said that he would only write about things that he had his own experience or observation. And Holiday Inn is a movie that has a song for every holiday of the year, you know, Valentine's Day and Easter and da da da, goes on. But he really was grounded when he came to Christmas because he said, I, I don't have the right, I don't have the ability to write something for this Christian holiday. What can I do? You need a song for Christmas because that's when Bing Crosby gets the girl. I'm sorry, that was a spoiler. What he did is he thought about what the Christmas experience meant to him. So he was raised happy and poor and sledding in the snow on the streets of Manhattan. And then he moved to Los Angeles where the only snow was on a Hollywood soundstage. Suddenly he knew that he wanted to touch how it is that people long for a remembered past, 
not as it really happened, but as it was dreamed. The combination of all the beautiful moments in life, exaggerated, perfect, tender, may your days be merry and bright and may all your Christmases be white. It's true for us now that we want a Christmas just like the ones we thought we used to know. But what truly made White Christmas become a heart song was that it was sung months before the movie came out by Bing Crosby on the radio, December 25th, 1941. It was a solo, but it became something else. It became a chorus of the longing of all the United States because it was the December 25th that was three weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and soldiers and sailors and Air Corps all over the country were saying goodbye and the nation was facing the biggest war they'd ever known and this song gave people peace not at the end of a war, but peace to face what they needed to face. War and fear and loss. We face fear and loss. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, God said. The song of a man finding peace after depression in the house of bread, where wise folk came to find a child so they could be generous. The rejected carol, that spoke out against African-American slavery and then sang across land and sea, and the movie Christmas tune that helped people share their longing for a distant, hopeful peace. They offer God's comfort and we become generous people, knowing that in spite of Zoom problems and snow, we have many gifts in our warm, wise hands. Amen. We have now the invitation to the offering. Uh, Norma notified me that she also lost power. So I will uh, give the invitation, the offering and the offering prayer. Okay. We always have something to give, even those who seem the poorest may be some of the richest among us. Let me share this prayer as we consider giving to this church, to our creator, to others, and to ourselves. God, we offer you the gold of our resources, the frankincense of our prayers, the myrrh of our time. Receive these gifts of our journeys and bless us with a newborn joy. Amen. Now let's sing in the doxology together. Uh, invite you all to share in communion. We'll have a communion hymn. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. For we 
with blessing in his hand Christ our God to earth descendeth our full homage to King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood, Lord of lords in human vesture, in the body Let all mortal flesh keep silent. I almost forgot to unmute. I don't know. Uh, I imagine that most of you have brought some bread and something to drink. Maybe not such a chalicey looking something, but something that will bring us the communion with Christ. We miss Harriet. She was going to read this introduction. I hope that she's able to see it this during the week. The story is told that during the Blitz in World War II Britain, when the city was strafed and bombed, Operation Pied Piper evacuated many children to the country, but some remained in London and many of those were orphans. Some were sheltered in a Jesuit order of brothers who noticed the children had trouble falling asleep or staying asleep night after night. When the children were being put to bed one night, one of the brothers guessed the children's problem was that they were anxious because of the uncertainty in their lives and gave each child a small piece of bread to hold in their hands and said something like this, hold on to this piece of bread when you're sleeping. Remember when you woke up this morning, you, we fed you and we took care of you. And when you wake up tomorrow, we will still be here for you. Let the bread remind you of this. Good night, children. And the children slept. Come to be comforted in the story of Bethlehem. Come to be comforted at this table by a handful of bread and a cup of love that will stay with you always. We remember the sacred story that happened in the house of bread for a new mother and a fostering father, sheep and shepherds, a few wise travelers with gifts, and many, many angels. And we remember that the baby named Jesus grew up to heal people and teach them with parables that made people angry. At Passover, he broke the unleavened bread and poured wine and love freely. Let us pray. Emmanuel, God with us, in our lonely nights under our guiding stars, with the hopes and fears of all our years. We come for comfort, for peace of mind and peace on earth, for a blessing on our hands and the bread in them, on our lips and the cup we lift to it. Touch the bread before you, touch or pour and touch the cup before you. 
May this bread and cup be your holy life, that we may ponder you in our hearts forever. Amen. The Holy Child of Bethlehem descends to us and is born in us in these days. Let us share the bread. We hear the Christmas angels, their great glad tidings tell. Let us drink deeply. Christ abides with us. Let us pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. God, we give you thanks that you have come to us in the child of Bethlehem, in this bread and cup, and in your answer to all our hopes and your offer of peace, deeper than any truce, truer than the upheaval that surrounds us. You have comforted us with your promise and your presence so that we too may spread the welcome wings of your good tidings. Amen. The closing song is Lo How a Rose Air Blooming.
May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the light of a loving countenance upon you and give you peace and lead you to joy this day and always. Amen. I think we have a postlude. A postlude and we'll see the candles extinguishing. Oh, good. And our postlude is, it came upon a midnight clear.
Max, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you for spending the second Sunday of Advent with FCCW New Hampshire. Well, I hope you have a great week, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>